Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Uh, so today we're going to begin a discussion on um, uh, nuclear decay. Um, uh, this is probably one of the most uh, characteristic properties of the nucleus, um, and we like to describe its general properties and uh, and show you how to do some very simple calculations uh, to to better understand why why a nucleus does in fact decay, why it's unstable. Uh, before we do that, it, it's probably useful to uh, real very quickly summarize what we learned in the last lecture. Uh, if you recall, we uh, we discussed the allowed nuclear quantum states in the nuclear potential well. Uh, there's a radius r that characterizes the mass density of a nucleus. That radius r varies with the atomic mass number of, in, of each individual nucleus. And uh, once once you have the radius r of the nuclear potential well, then you can start to calculate quantum mechanically the allowed nuclear states uh, that uh, that fill up, um, that must be filled in order to uh, to accommodate all the nucleons in the nucleus. So it's important to understand the importance. It's important to understand this diagram, right? Uh, first of all, it's a qualitative diagram. It just indicates the order in which the nuclear states are filled. Uh, this order uh, reproduces the uh, the uh, magic uh, magic numbers for stable nuclei, right? So there are uh, certain nuclei with certain numbers of neutrons and protons that seem to be exceptionally stable, and the uh, the advantage of this. Uh, 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 scheme here for the uh, the nuclear states. Uh, the advantage of this scheme is that it in fact reproduces those those magic numbers for the nucleus. Um, the uh, once you have the shape of this nuclear potential well, and once you have the order in which these states are filled, uh, then it's just a matter of dropping nucleons into the uh, into the potential well. Uh, there's a separate well for neutrons and for protons. Uh, as we, re as you might recall, the proton nuclear well actually has a repulsive uh, uh, Coulomb potential uh, that, that's uh, uh, located in this region of the of the diagram. Uh, uh, the lower energy states that uh, that are filled first, as you put nuclei nucleons into this potential well, those those lower energy uh, nucleons uh, or those those nucleons at the bottom of the well are are much more tightly bound. Uh, they're much more stable. And as you continue to to fill up these uh, these energy states, right, uh, nucleons at the top of the well become less tightly bound, and in fact they can escape or they can be caused to. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, jump out of the nucleus, and uh, that gives rise to this idea of a nuclear decay, right? So if you if you excite some of these higher energy uh, nuclear states um, uh, by let's say uh, excitation with uh, with uh, energetic particles, uh, right? It's possible to eject them from the nucleus, and in the process of ejecting them from the nucleus, you form a completely new element, chemical element. And uh, the original nucleus is then said to decay. And so the topic of this discussion or the topic of this lecture is basically to discuss this, this decay of, of, of nuclei. So I'd like to do that discussion in a, in a historical sense and uh, try to just give you a feeling for when these important discoveries were made. Um, uh, the big, uh, the first big discovery was in 1895 when when X-rays were discovered. One year later, this French scientist Henri Becquerel uh, discovered that uranium salts emitted uh, very penetrating uh, uh, radiation. Uh, this was really quite a surprise. It, it was not obvious what what was going on. Um, he uh, he assigned two of his students to uh, investigate this problem more carefully. Um, Madame Curie, Marie Curie, and her husband Pierre worked on this problem for a few years. And in 1898, uh, Marie Curie uh, isolates two new elements uh, from this uh, 
uh, from these uranium salts, and these two elements are named polonium and radium. Um, in 1903, uh, uh, Marie Curie receives a PhD degree in, uh, from France. In fact, she was the first woman, I believe, to receive, receive such a degree in France. And uh, in 1903, uh, uh, Becquerel, uh, Marie Curie, and her husband, Pierre, share the Nobel Prize for the discovery of this spontaneous radioactivity. And what's notable about uh, Marie Curie is that she, uh, she actually received a second Nobel Prize eight years later in 1911. Uh, she was granted the Nobel Prize in chemistry for her isolation of these two uh, radioactive elements from, uh, from uranium uh, ores. So uh, uh, historically, this, this subject goes, goes well back over 100 years. And uh, what we like to do is we like to summarize what we now know. Right. Uh, what we now know is that as the nucleus becomes larger, it, it tends to become unstable. And uh, there's basically no stable nuclei uh, for isotopes with atomic number greater than about 82. And the reason is that as the nucleus becomes larger and larger, you're packing more protons and more neutrons into a very small region of space. There's an electrostatic repulsion that sets in, the Coulomb repulsion that sets in between the protons because they have both positive charges. And then in addition, there's this very strong short-range attractive nuclear force that binds the neutrons and the protons and the protons to each other. And uh, as long as there are enough neutrons in the nucleus uh, to, uh, to uh, mediate this uh, strong attractive force between all nucleons, the, nucle the nucleus becomes stable, but as you uh, pack more and more nucleons into uh, the nucleus, uh, the electrostatic repulsive forces uh, start to win out, and uh, the nucleus actually becomes unstable and decays. So historically, there have been three decay modes that, uh, that have been identified for all nuclear matter. Uh, the first two decay modes were discovered in 1899, and they're referred to as alpha and beta decays. And then a few years later, this gamma emission uh, uh, was, uh, was identified in 1903. So the gamma, we now know, is, uh, is uh, uh, the uh, emission of an energetic uh, photon, uh, an X-ray uh, from the nucleus. Uh, the alpha and beta emissions, or the alpha and be beta decay modes, uh, involve the um, uh, ejection of, of charged particles from the nucleus itself. And uh, we'll talk more about these decay modes in the next lecture. I'll go into those, those details. Uh, the big picture, if you really want to understand uh, the, the, the stability of a nucleus, you, you have to understand this particular plot. It's a very important plot in nuclear physics. Um, uh, what it does is it plots the number of protons along this axis, so that's, that's labeled by the, uh, the, the quantity Z. Along this axis, uh, you plot the number of neutrons, and that's designated by the number capital N uh, for, uh, for different nuclei. So there have been about 3,000 isotopes of different nuclei that have been identified. They've been created in nuclear reactors and in particle accelerators. And um, if you, uh, if you uh, represent each of those 3,000 nuclei, nuclei by a dot uh, on this plot, uh, you can split, split all these, these 3,000 or so nuclei into two categories. One category is a stable isotope. This is a nucleus that remains stable over time. Uh, the other uh, category is a radioactive isotope, and this is an isotope that decays over time. And so what you can see is uh, there's three important features from this, uh, from this plot that you have to take away, right? First important feature is there's a stability band, which is indicated by these black dots, right? These are the stable isotopes. Uh, I believe there's something like 250 stable isotopes that are known to man, right? Uh, all the other uh, points on this graph are in red, and, that, and those red, uh, red points indicate the particular values of N and Z, right, uh, that uh, uh, produce radioactive nuclei. 
The other thing you'll note from this plot is that there's a line which is uh, labeled n is equal to z. This is a line in which uh, the nucleus has the exact same number of neutrons as protons. And what you see is that for all the nuclei known, uh, z is about equal to n up until about uh, number of protons z is about 20. That's the element calcium. And uh, below that, that uh, uh, element in the periodic table, uh, these are very light nuclei, and, and the number of protons is, is exactly equal to the number of neutrons. As you start to pack more and more protons into the nucleus, what you have to do is you have to increase the number of neutrons such that n is greater than z, and that is, that's indicated by the fact that this curve here deviates significantly from the n equals z line. So that's the second important point that you have to remember from this, uh, this plot. And the third, third plot is that there are no stable nuclei, no stable isotopes for Z greater than 83. So I think 83 is bismuth in the periodic table. And you can see that up here, all the nuclei uh, uh, at high uh, uh, proton numbers are unstable, right? The, the nuclear, the, the stability line, right, indicated by the black dots. Uh, that ends right around z equal to 83. So those are the three important points that you have to take away from this diagram, and that's telling us something very fundamental about the, uh, the stability of, of uh, the known nuclei. I'll just mention that there are a number of uh, very useful charts of nucleides on the web, and I just give two examples. Uh, you can go to these interactive charts and you can investigate uh, all kinds of properties of these various nuclei, right? Just by clicking various buttons, uh, for instance, you can, you can, uh, you can start to learn the decay modes and you can start to learn about how long the, uh, uh, the nuclei live, these radioactive nuclei live. It turns out this plot here is useful because it's color coded in terms of the lifetime of these nuclei where dark colors indicate stable nuclei, and these uh, lighter yellow and red colors indicate nuclei that decay very rapidly over time. Um, all the decay modes for uh, the nuclei have been worked out in great detail. And again, uh, this is a website that I, I refer to very often uh, because it allows you just by uh, clicking on various uh, uh, elements uh, you can actually investigate and learn uh, the, the details of the decay modes for, for the different uh, nuclei that are, that are present. So you've, um, right, you can, you can investigate these. These things are very well known now, um, and, and they're very easy to, uh, to learn about if you go to these different websites. Um, if we return back to the, um, the essential ingredients of radioactivity, uh, what we learn is that by doing some very simple experiments at the turn in the early, very early 1900s, right, it was possible to identify these three different decay modes, which we've already identified as alpha, beta, and gamma decay. Uh, the idea is pretty simple. If you have a radioactive uh, isotope, uh, you, uh, you, you collimate the radioactive decay products by, let's say, encasing that radioactive isotope in a, in a lead shield. And um, you then allow those radioactive decay products to pass through a region of space where there's a magnetic field that's, that's oriented perpendicular to the page of this, of this slide. And uh, so the idea is very simple. If the uh, charged particles that are, if the particles that are emitted from these nuclear decays have a charge, right, they're going to bend different ways depending on whether the charge is positive or negative. Uh, and you can, you can sort out which direction they're going to bend just by using the, the Lorentz force equation, which says that there's a force on a charged particle Q, uh, which has a velocity V as it passes through a magnetic field B. And uh, in this way, it's very simple to, to uh, realize that alpha particles have a positive charge associated with them. They curve one way. Beta particles have a negative charge associated with them. They curve the other way. And these things called gammas um, 
don't don't uh, don't feel any uh, uh, Lorentz force whatsoever, which means they're they're uncharged. Uh, the other thing that you can learn from this type of experiment is how powerful the emission is, and uh, you can do that by uh, investigating what type of material you need to stop these various uh, uh, radioactive emissions. And it turns out that alpha particles uh, barely penetrate into a sheet of paper, so that if you take a couple of sheets of paper and, and you place, place those sheets of papers in the path of the alpha particles, you essentially attenuate the alpha particles so that none pass through. Uh, the, the beta particles are um, uh, uh, more energetic, right? They have an opposite sign to the alpha, so the alpha particles are positively charged, the beta particles are negatively charged, and these betas penetrate a few millimeters of aluminum uh, before they're stopped. So they're much more penetrating than the alphas. And then lastly, these gammas are the most energetic uh, uh, particles uh, that are emitted from the, from the radioactive nucleus. It requires several centimeters of lead to stop these, uh, these gamma particles. So you get a sense of the, uh, the energetics of these particles just by doing these very simple uh, uh, experiments. It's important to characterize how many of these nuclei decay per second. That's discussed in the next slide. Uh, there are two units of radioactivity that have been used historically. The first one is the, uh, the original unit that was invented by Curie herself. And, uh, when, when, when a radioactive source is said to have a radioactive or a, a decay rate of one Curie, that means that you're getting about 3.7 times 10 to the 10th decay products per second that, that emanate from that, uh, chunk of radioactive material. Uh, the decays, it doesn't matter whether they're alpha, betas, or gammas, right? It's just the number of decays per second that's, ma that, that's measured. And um, this is kind of a funny unit, 3.7 times 10 to the 10 decays per second, and it's a historical definition because roughly one gram of radium is equal to uh, one curie of radioac radioactivity. So uh, that, that, that is the historical reason why this unit of radioactivity was invented because it was easy, reasonably easy to get one gram of radium uh, back in the uh, very early 1900s and that, that was then used to calibrate uh, the various counters that were used. Um, more recently, the, the new unit of, of radioactivity is the Becquerel and the Becquerel is de defined as one decay per second. So one Curie uh, is equal to 3.7 times 10 to the 10th Becquerels. That's, that's the bottom line. Uh, it's probably useful just to mention some representative orders of magnitude for different radioactive sources. And I try to do that in this diagram here just to give you a sense for what the, what the values of these quantities are. Um, if, you, um, if you've ever seen one of the old watches that used to glow in the dark, uh, those watches were painted with, with radium paint, right? And so the radium watch dials have, a, have an activity of about one microcurie. That's about 3.7 times 10 to the fourth decays per second. Uh, so a microcurie is very, very weak source of, of radioactivity. If you ask what is the hottest... Uh, uh, um, naturally occurring uh, region in, on Earth. Uh, I've read web stories that say this beach in Guarapari, Brazil is, right? So one kilogram of beach sand from this, uh, this particular beach has an activity of about 2.2 microcuries. So that's, um, that's about 8.3 times 10 to the fourth uh, decays per second. And of course, that beach sand is just naturally radioactive because it's been washed out of the mountains. Uh, the mountains, I think, are, are, are rich in some radioactive uh, elements, and, and as a result, uh, the beach gets pretty hot uh, uh, radioactivity-wise. Uh, radioactivity the typical lab source that you might use to do experiments has a, has a radioactivity of about one millicurie. Um, uh, that's that's pretty still pretty safe. Uh, when you start to radiate cells and the radiation of the cells, when a cell is exposed to this 
to this radiation of about 10 curies. The cells tend to die. Um, radiation therapy, right? So if you, if you go to hospitals and you have tumors treated with radiation therapy, typically that's on the, uh, that, 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 uh, the, the number of decays per second that your body's exposed to is on the order of a thousand curies. It's very localized. Um, I also give some, uh, some examples of man-made uh, 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 radioactivity that's been released to the environment. Um, right? Oak Ridge, Tennessee is estimated to release about a million curies of radioactivity over its lifetime. Uh, the former Soviet Union uh, has uh, various sites located uh, throughout the Soviet Union. Uh, there, the uh, radioactivity released is, is, is considerably higher. It's on the order of 10 to the ninth curies. Uh, so uh, maybe a thousand times higher than the radioactivity that's been released from Oak Ridge. And um, these, these estimates here should be compared to the total radioactivity that's estimated to be in the world's oceans, for instance. And that number is, is obtained uh, in various ways. It's a, it's, some, it's a number something on the order of 4 times 10 to the 11th curies, which is an incredible, incredible amount of decays per second. Uh, but that's dispersed over, over the entire ocean, um, right? I also give a plot um, of the radioactive hotspots in the world, and I estimate um, the different types of radioactivity that have been uh, uh, measured in those in those various hotspots. Right here, here's this beach in Brazil. It's supposed to be the hottest beach in the world. Uh, the Soviet Union has two or three sites, uh, which various um, for which by for various reasons have. Uh, produced a huge amount of radioactivity contamination in the environment. And then the United States, uh, right, there's a site in Washington, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and then down here, the Savannah River uh, Nuclear Project. Uh, they've also released a fair amount of uh, radioactivity, uh, but not nearly as much as, as, as what, what's been reported from uh, some of the accidents that have occurred in the Soviet Union. So this is a very brief overview, tries to give you a, a sense of, of, of what nuclear decay is and, and how you measure radioactivity. In the next lecture, uh, we're actually going to uh, uh, talk uh, specifically about alpha, beta, and gamma decays and try to give you a sense for, um, uh, for how those uh, radioactive decays can be studied and understood. So uh, come on back and listen to that. It's uh, the arithmetic is pretty simple, and uh, it allow you to appreciate some of the uh, 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 facts that you you read in the Sunday newspapers. Right, you'll have a better appreciation uh, for some of the uh, discussions that you find about nuclear safety and and uh, 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 nuclear reactors. So uh, we'll see you when you have a chance to listen to that lecture.